My name is Gianluca Zanna. I was an Italian by birth and I became an American by choice. Our lives and freedoms are in danger. This is not a dream. If you're listening to this broadcasting, you are the resistance. Welcome to Love, Guns and Freedom. Here we go guys and girls, you're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom with Luca Zanna on K Talks 1340 AM and on United FM network. Another Sunday, another show. I tell you, one, one of the most beautiful things that I had the pleasure and the opportunity to have through this show is to meet very incredible people out there. Normally, I probably I, I never would be able to meet them. And it's not just about meeting them, because of course you can meet people on Facebook, you know, it's a big humanity out there now. It's beautiful, you know, you can reach people from around the world. I love that. But also you can uh, somehow uh, have the chance to ask them questions. You know, I'm always so curious. I like to know what's going on. And uh, one thing that for sure I learned that I don't know everything and I always learn new things. And uh, when I have somebody who has been, uh, let's say, behind the scenes, especially in, in our military force, okay, in this case, the Navy, at a pretty high level, okay? It's not just regular private. It's the guy that would do that as for career. So he saw things, uh, he's been in places that normally we don't, but we hear through the fake news, because that for me is fake news, you know that, most of them. So I like to know his input, I like to know about his opinion, especially when you know that people that normally, they, when they're serving, they don't have that right, like we're supposed to have as a first call, a First Amendment right. They cannot express their opinions, they cannot express even what they really seeing. Sometimes they're also binded by secrecy. So, and I'm not gonna ask him things that he cannot say today, but I have a guest today, that uh, I enjoy his conversation. I also pretty much we think alike on many issues. And uh, I like to know more about state of the event of things that happen in today, things that happened to this country the last 15 years. And uh, since he was there and he's seen things and places that I didn't do, I would like to ask him also what he really thinks, what was going on and what's going on right now with America and the rest of the world when it comes down to also our military, okay? Now, his name is Michael. I will leave him like that for his privacy. And Michael, he will introduce himself and uh, he will give you a little bit of an idea, you know, what is done. Michael, are you there? I'm here, Luca. Nice to meet you again. Normally we interact on Facebook and I like your post. I think that we have some sort of a like-minded mentality on some issues at least. And um, thank you for coming here. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, I agree. I think we see eye to eye on a lot of things. Question now. Uh, give us a little bit, you know, as I said, I respect your privacy. Of course, you know, you had a very interesting job that is more than a job. Uh, you are sometimes worn also to secrecy on so many aspects. But let's put it things. You say as much as you can or as you're allowed to say about your personal professional background when it comes that you served in the Navy, U.S. Navy, correct? Yes, that's correct. Give us a little bit of your background, please. Well, I, I started off um, as an officer on a destroyer, um, which is, you know, nothing very glamorous as far as the Navy goes. It's kind of like the Navy's equivalent of the infantry, if you will, in that, you know, in, in the infantry, it you know, doesn't get a lot of glamour. Uh, they just do their jobs every day. Um, and then um, after four years, um, I came out and was in the reserves for... Oh, I guess it was uh, 18 years uh, with some active duty uh, interspersed in between. So I've been to a lot of interesting places uh, in the world, um, the last of which, and at my highest rank, uh, was in the Middle East and, and eventually in Afghanistan, which is a weird place for a ship guy to be, yeah. uh, especially, especially when his bosses um, are primarily from the Army, but the people who work for him are from all the different services, uh, including, you know, the the active duty component, the reserves, which has been activated, and the National Guard. 
Yeah, interesting. I mean, really, a Navy guy in the middle of the desert of Afghanistan without a ship is kind of uh, almost uh, out of place from looking from here. I mean, well, it was it was pretty weird. You know, um, in the Navy, for instance, we don't usually have a lot of contact with small arms unless we're um, you know, specialized uh, like the SEALs are. Uh, but, you know, our, our aviators, our submariners, our ship guys, uh, they don't generally run around with weapons strapped to their bodies. Mm -hmm. And and so uh, that was new. Uh, it wasn't completely uncomfortable for me as far as the weapons are concerned, just because I grew up with small arms. My father is a World War II veteran. Yeah. Uh, but, even, but even so, it was... Uh, It was, it was a fish out of water uh, okay. to a large extent. Interesting. Now, when, uh, when you retired, or at least when you finished your service, what was your last uh, task that you were working at or where you were working, period? Well, we were, we were visiting various bases uh, throughout the Middle East and Afghanistan and looking for vulnerabilities, which we then could mm -hmm. um, report to the commanding officers at the various bases and tell them, you know, how they might potentially go about making their bases safer. Okay, interesting job. Now, question is, you know, I read your post, okay? And if I didn't know you for your background, you don't sound like the typical uh, yes sir guy, okay? You think, <laughs> you, you use your brain a lot. And like me, you know, that's why I couldn't serve in the Italian army. I mean, when I did my academy, uh, I started there. I realized that, unfortunately, I wasn't fit for that type of task because I use my brain and I question authority, especially when the authority, in my opinion, is wrong. Sorry. Oh, right. uh, that's why I sure. couldn't make it. But, you know, you seem like kind of a different type of guy. Question, how did you make it so long? <laughs> uh, believe me, a lot of times it wasn't easy. Um, certainly, you know, as we get to a certain point uh, with rank, Uh, it's easier to speak our minds, and yeah. we're less likely to have at least, you know, direct, you know, retribution. Um, but um, uh, sometimes it was hard. Uh, I think maybe sometimes it was just because, um, uh, I don't know, was I diplomatic? Mm -hmm. I think I could be diplomatic sometimes, but, uh, but you're right. Um, I rustled feathers. Uh, maybe that's why it took me so long to get promoted. Um, I was passed over twice uh, for each of my last two ranks. Mm. Uh, but eventually, I guess uh, people who wear stars on their collars um, saw that I had something going and, uh, and they promoted me. So when you retired, what was your last rank? My last rank was a commander, okay. which, which in, the, in the Navy uh, is the equivalent uh, to a lieutenant colonel in the uh, Okay. Ground forces okay. or, or air forces. Okay, interesting. Okay. And I know you also speak a little bit of Italian. You went to Italy for a while. Am I right or not? Well, I've, I have visited Italy. Um, I had an Italian girlfriend ah. uh, way back before I got married. Interesting. Uh, but, um, uh, but actually, I, uh, <laughs> I went to Italy uh, on leave once um, and so therefore got to uh, get to Europe and then from Germany to Italy on um, military aircraft and then after that we got your rail passes and we just went around that was mm -hmm. when we were more or less newlyweds uh, okay. you know, back around 2000 mm -hmm. interesting very good now at least i have some questions for you because uh the opportunity that uh, you know you were there especially during this time that uh, fresh out of 9 11 after 9 11 that uh, we're supposed to believe at, at least they try to make us believe that uh, Uh, Saddam Hussein has weapons of mass destruction and uh, Afghanistan was a threat. We had to go to Afghanistan. We have to go to Iraq. And then we realized today, even of course, we already knew that something was wrong, many of us, since the beginning. But the real, let's say, funding uh, for this operation, according to proof now, there is also a bill in the U.S. Congress connects the Saudis with the funding the Uh, let's say, allege, uh, you know, perpetrators of 9-11. So this bill is trying to at least let the families to sue the Saudis. But of course, this bill, it was stopped by the Obama administration. And now, of course, there is also an attempt by uh, public relations firms hired by the Saudi Arabia to recruit veterans to lobby against this bill that's supposed to allow a family 
that was a victim of 9-11 to sue the country for its role in financing the attack. I mean, at least let's have a chance to bring evidence. What do you think about this, first of all? What do you think, uh, if, if you can speak freely now, I guess you can, uh, what do you think, first of all, about 9-11? We're supposed to believe the official version from the government or maybe there is much more for our eyes, for our brain, for the logic, just from the logic. What do you think? Well, to begin with, um, honestly, um, I don't know completely what to believe about 9-11. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's certainly con there are certainly conflicting reports. I yeah. don't believe the official story. And I've heard some very credible um, lectures uh, about what might have happened, uh, whether it was directed energy weapons, whether there was, you know, some, uh, you know, uh, internal explosion. But, uh, you know, the, the idea, I, I think it was, uh, is it Bill Lear? Um, it's, um, no, John Lear, Bill Lear's son. Yeah. Who is about the most incredible, most credible pilot I think I've ever heard. I went to the FAA's website and I took a look at his credentials, which are completely impeccable. Yes. And he was saying that there's no way that an aircraft at those speeds uh, could be flown dead center times two into the towers. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, so I honestly don't believe that the airplanes could have been maneuvered like that. Uh, they're not made to fly at high speed, low down. One thing, one thing, uh, Michael. One thing. Let's start from the easy thing, okay? Things that uh, sure, for sure, sure we there is not even to this for me to, to debate much. For example, there is a joke I used to say: there were three towers going down with two planes. How can be that possible? Absolutely. I mean, building no, seven. No, ab ab absolutely. Uh, building seven wasn't hit, um, and apparently even below the um, you know, the the two main structures. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if you if you looked into the basements, yeah, um, you know there there was there was no debris. Um, it's there. It, it's very strange, yeah. and um, you know was you know so what was it? You know if the if the airplanes didn't hit it, and we can't believe our eyes because. You know, re remember, there's an old saying that s says, don't believe anything you hear and only half of what you see. Yeah, it's true. You know, the, you know even people nearby, um, you know, could have been fooled by technology. Yeah. And like I said, it's, it's not clear to me what did happen, but it's pretty clear what did not happen. I agree. I and agree. I, 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 you know, and I'm sure that, you know, a couple of guys with box cutters who had no experience mm -hmm. flying airplanes could maneuver... Um, you know, two you know um, highly complex jets into direct center line hits on um, on on the on the trade to, on the towers, and then and then what was it like 24 hours later or something? Have another one fall down in free fall as a result. I mean, you know, we're stupid, but we're not that stupid. Unfortunately, no. They got us stupid for a while, at least for a good part of this uh, world, not just America. But one thing also, I, for example, that Build It 7 for me was the first thing that said, wow, something I'm really, it, it is wrong. Something we've been lied to. But the second thing that really, I couldn't even really sleep at night was the Pentagon. You know, the fact that there is uh, a video of CNN the probably you watch it. The first video of uh, uh, of the crew going to see the Pentagon after the alleged plane hit the Pentagon, the same CNN reporter said there is no trace of any plane, and the hole was about 15 feet, uh, you know, big uh, before it started yeah. to collapse. So it is right there for me. It's like you know, you're talking down to a stupid kid. I wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to talk to a child to tell him that type of story. And still, you know, they're doing that to us. What do you think about the Pentagon? Well, I, the Pentagon actually was the, the, the first one that I looked at and I said, wow, this is, this is just crazy. I mean, first of all, where's the footage? Yeah. You know, I mean, talk about a place that has more cameras. Now, to be fair, I've never actually been to the Pentagon. Um, but... So far as I understand, it has more video surveillance cameras than pretty much any place on Earth, yet there's no footage of this airplane hitting. Also, if you notice where it hit, it hit almost near ground level. Yeah. Good, good luck maneuvering an yeah. airplane. Are you kidding that. me? I mean, you know, I mean, you're a... You, I couldn't you, have that with a Cessna. 
Well, no, I, I'm not sure you could have done it with a Cessna. Yeah, I mean, that's. I mean, it's, I, I mean, you'll think about the precision yeah. piloting uh-huh. that that require that that requires, yep. and then the other part is is like where are the wings. Yeah, where are the wings? <laughs> we're at, we right. are talking about titanium engines, okay? Huge Rolls Royce titanium engines out of the blue, vaporized. And you see, and by the way, one thing I, we've been fighting so long, and it's still we didn't get anything out of it. Uh, I want to see the footage. Let's see this plane. Why can we not see the plane crash into the Pentagon? It took like two years or more of lawsuit. And then finally, they released uh, some short, very couple of photographs. And there was no plane. It was just a blast. And then we had to listen to O'Reilly try to brainwash it. Can you see the plane? Can you see the plane? No, I don't see the plane. You can tell me how many times you want. I didn't see the plane. There is no plane. That's a fact. But I wanted to hear your well, feedback. It, you know, I it, mean, it, to, to me, it's just ridiculous. Yeah. Um, you know, and don't misunderstand. I think that I have friends who were actually in the Pentagon when it happened. In mm-hmm. fact, um, you know, one of my early colleagues uh, from the military may have died there. Uh, I'm not sure because I know someone with his name died there. Yeah. Uh, I'm not. I'm not sure it was him. Someone with his name and his rank. And wow. his service. So, but he had, you know, kind of a, uh, you know, a, a fairly common Irish name. So I can't be completely sure. But mm. I, you know, I'm pretty sure that also one of my friends, who is now an admiral, was there on that day. Uh, but don't misunderstand me. I mean, I'm not saying that they would know what happened if they were inside. No, no, they don't. It's. Uh, uh, you know, but you one know, thing and, I tell and, you. And, go ahead. Well, and the other thing is that. You know, people often believe the stories that they're given, but then again, uh, you know, Hitler and Goebbels said something about that too. They said you can't just tell a lie; you have to take tell a whopper. Mm-hmm. You have to tell something that is so unbelievable that no one would believe that you have the audacity to make a lie like that. It's true. It is true. And then, and then you have to say it over and over and over again, yes. and people will believe it. And they were right. And it's a sad thing, you know, a lot of people out there, that's why I wanted to bring you into there. People may say, what a second, it's 2017, this happened 2001. I mean, why are you even still bringing this up? Because my point is there are still enough people out there, unfortunately, that uh, there are two, tif- I, I consider people in two different types. One, they are the real idiots, seriously, that they cannot even tie their shoes and there is nothing much you can say. Their brain is limited. But there are people out there that they're smart. They know the truth, but they're afraid to even be I don't know, named, maybe sometimes, I remember years ago, they used to call me a trader or they used to call me whatever, you know, just because I want to know the truth. But my point is, if you have not the courage to stand for this country, uh, not stand for our fellow Americans and who died, and also for all the soldiers out there that they are dying on a war, fake war based on a lie, this is, for me, the most important, the biggest act of patriotism, to stand for the truth. That's what I'm trying to do. This and my goal, our goal here, even it's 15, 16, 17 years later. I don't care. We need to reach out as many people as we can, wake them up, to reach critical mass, to bring justice. Because I really believe that uh, these perpetrators, we will need, we need to find them out. And for crimes like that, for homicide or mass murdering, and all these very serious crimes, there is no type of uh, prescription time. Okay, I mean, statute of limitation, they are not, uh, they are forever. So we need to find justice. One day we need to do that. So I like to bring people like you who have a lot of credibility. And also, of course, you know things that normally other people don't know. And I want to start to say, wait a second, this is not about uh, being a bunch of hippies, trying to criticize Bush. This is about standing for the truth. And if many people out there, they still believe that 9-11 was a bunch of, uh, you know, Arabs with the, with the box cutters and Saddam uh, was the bad guy. And guess what? You need to wake up. That's all I'm trying to say here. Go ahead. Well, well, I mean, let's back off on a couple of things. One is, was Saddam a bad guy? Sure, Saddam was a bad guy. Mm-hmm. But what does that have? But what does that have to do with us? Yeah. You know, the the other the other issue is, and I think you made a great you know salient point about the idea of people going to kill and potentially die. And I'm not sure which one is worse, honestly. You know, killing for a lie or dying for a lie. Um, where they would not otherwise go, you know, based on this lie. In fact, I'm one of those people. You mm-hmm. know, after 9-11, yeah. I believed that we had been attacked. My, yeah. see, my, my heart sank, and I thought to myself, this, you know, let's see, we don't live in the same country 
that I grew up in. Yeah. And, and, and so, you know, and so I thought, you know, what, what is one of the only legitimate um, reasons to go to war? It's either to defend your country or to retaliate for an attack. Yeah. You know, which, which, by the way, has been used throughout U.S. history in order to justify going to these wars. Mm-hmm. But if you, but, you know, so, you know, they, you know, after 9-11, honestly, 9-12, I was sure that they were going to call me up, and it took over a year. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I was, I was actually, you know, getting to the point where, okay, I, you know, maybe they won't call me up. But when they called, but when they called me up, you know, people I knew, you know, would ask me, "Well, are you are you scared?" Um, you know, um, you know, you know, um, you know you're, they they tell me I was brave. Well, you know, first of all, I was scared. Yeah. In fact, yeah. in fact, I was. You know, when I got my orders, actually, they were first verbal orders, and the truth is, they didn't even know where I was going. Wow. And, and you know, and and I said to my, I said to myself, okay, well, you know, not only have I been taking the paycheck for all these years where I'd said that I would go, but we've been attacked. Yeah. And so, and and so, you know, if I if I end up over there, then you know, then you know, fair enough. You know, this is this is my job. We've been attacked, and we can't have this. But the problem is, then in retrospect. You know, you look. I look back and I think, wow. You know, I was a rube like everybody else, and I think that's probably as much of a painful issue for me as anything, because you know, you. The, what's interesting is, and I found this out actually very early in my career. I was still a midshipman, and I found out that, of course, you know, you know, midshipmen are not supposed to lie, cheat, or steal. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the government can tell you official lies, and they are lies, they just don't present them that way, because of course they don't want you to know that it's a lie. And, you know, so they hold the people who work for them in the military to a much, much higher standard than they as an organization are being held to, and or hold themselves to. Yeah. And it's just it's yeah. it's just disgusting. And this and this does not impugn any of my friends who are still, you know, doing what they're doing. Um, though, you know, I, I, I hope that at least they've done some serious soul searching about what's going on. Because they're they're patriotic people. They believe they're doing the right thing. Uh, unfortunately, um, I think that, you know, most people don't ever question their assumptions and this is the problem not just with these uh, governments all governments in general in italy the same thing you know a government they have uh, pretty much the right to kill uh if you do it it's murder if they if they do it government it's okay it's part of national security or part of uh, defending the whatever the special interest a same story they can lie and they can experiment you know you for the goodness of the country and uh, this is sad you know because as i said uh they have uh, this is not right uh, they have the, the different standard. I mean, we are not their cattle. We suppose the government is supposed to work for us. Instead, now the last probably, especially speaking for this country, you know, the last 100 years at least, uh, the role is government, it changed. You know, it's becoming our master. Now, question is, uh, uh, you, you say something, well, I, go ahead. Well, I, I, I would just say with that, I mean, it's, I would say even that it's a little funny and perhaps naive without insulting you, mm-hmm to believe that government ever was really intended to work for the people. I, mean, I agree. You know, granted, you, granted, you know, a, you know the, the American experiment in republicanism was unique in that it was kind of the first one in the modern era, yeah. you know, coming out of a, a, a long period of uh, monarchies, who, by the way, kept their authority you know, supposedly from God, mm-hmm. and and in fact they get it you know from the church, so they yeah. dupe people that way. Yes. Uh, but but if you look at the history, the the ink wasn't even dry on the Constitution before government started to uh, backpedal. Yeah, but this is this true, you know. But the point, at least here, we had uh, an experiment that there was never tried or attempted anywhere else. 
and uh, he, he, of course we lost it uh, pretty much uh, uh, pretty faster but at least uh, the idea the embryo of, of, of this country the dna is different from every other places out there coming from europe for me especially i still believe uh, for me we have this uh, right uh to have a government working for the people now it's up to us to take it back it's up to us to uh you know even struggle if we have to but we have this right in europe you never had a right you never had a bill of rights you never had the declaration of independence you know you transition from the roman empire as a slave and then you go through the pope time as a slave or this case you could be maybe uh one of the enforcers but the point is there's always some sort of a uh, you know the nobility is always out there and you are if you're not part of them you are a slave even now whatever they call a republic it is not a republic it's a class of uh, slaves and then there is the class of the elite pretty much what's happening right now also here now one thing i want to ask you um sure when uh, you know right now after you retired you start to look at things probably with with more critical eyes you know uh, you know very well that uh, you know the constitution you were talking about the navy is the only really uh, constitutional form of force that we're supposed to have never we're supposed to have a standing army am i right or wrong that's correct in fact i would say that the navy and the marine corps mm -hmm. are the are the only two branches because of course the the marine corps is part of the navy uh, that's authorized to be standing under the Constitution. The Constitution specifically says that you know Congress will raise armies and support a navy. Well, raising an army mm -hmm. has to do you know suggest that the armies are not there most of the time. Yes, Suppor yeah. supporting a navy, however, and you know and and the requisite Marine Corps means that it's always supposed to be there. Yeah. And I think that's one of the reasons that I was able to be philosophically in military service as long as I was, is because it wasn't military service, it was naval service. Yeah. And, yeah. and, they, and our economy, and in fact, you know, world commerce, and, you know, and there is peace through commerce. Um, you know, commerce is protected by navies. Yes, yes. And uh, also, you know, the idea of standing army on our soil, things that uh, right now, of course, they change also with the uh, Posse Comitatus has been repealed several times, you know, at least the last since 9-11 with different uh, pieces of legislations. Are you familiar with the National Defense Authorization Act of 2012? signed by Obama with the Congress, of course, was Republican Congress, uh, but signed by the President Obama, uh, that pretty much says that uh, there is a clause of ind indefinite detention. And I want to always remind that because sometimes people say, oh, I didn't hear that. Okay, no excuse. Uh, pretty much what happens now, the government, or at least a branch of the government, can declare an enemy combatant or a potential uh, terrorist that you don't need to be go under any type of due process just because they suspect you to be a terrorist they can detain you indefinitely that means no access to any type of uh, basic uh, rights you know you go back to before pre magna carta that means there is no body of the crime no ma no more abuse corpus this is belong to a complete middle ages uh and i want to remind people Today could be what they call the Arab guy with a turban. Tomorrow could be to the right wing or tomorrow could be to the left wing. Doesn't matter. Everybody deserves a due process. Otherwise, that power can be abused. What do you think about this where we are right now? And they can use, by the way, the military to come and get you. Did you hear about that? Well, you know, and that, that's actually the most disturbing and disgusting part is um, this, first of all, the Patriot Act, or the, I'm sorry, the NDAA in 2012 is not unprecedented. It's mm -hmm. unprecedented as a law, yeah. but the same thing was done by executive fiat yes. during the Civil War, and it, w and it was done again during World War II. Yes. Um, so the idea that they suspend the Constitution means that the Constitution really doesn't mean anything as far as these people are concerned. I agree. Yeah. Uh, you, know, you know, the Constitution, you know, it's, it's a nice piece of paper, and when people really believe in it, it's, it's probably one of the greatest documents ever, you know, written by man. But if it's not worth the paper it's written on, what's the point? Exactly. No, exactly. You're right. You know, I mean, let's not forget World War II, what happened for the, all these uh, American. They were Japanese heritage or even Italian heritage or German heritage, but mostly the exactly. Japanese, you know, they went really exact. destroyed their lives. You know, I mean, these people, they were Americans and they had to spend time in a camp for years.
that's so wrong. You know, that's so terrible. Seriously. Please, well, well you know, it's, it's bad enough to be in a camp. Yeah. But what about... What about the people who die in the camp? What about the fact that when they ship them off, okay, yeah. they had to sell or abandon all of their property, their yeah. businesses, their homes, yeah. their property? That's not American. No. Or is it? <laughs> that's, I mean, and that's, wow. and that's part of the problem. The, the, the only issue I have with, with any of this, and I mean, it sounds sometimes like I'm pretty anti-American, but I'm not because this is still the best place. It just shows that there are a lot of other places that really suck worse. Yeah. And it's our job, you know, it's our duty, you know, for you especially, I tell you, you know, and for people even like me, even I did never serve in this country, but I took an oath. And when you took the oath as you uh, to defend this republic, okay, I mean, that's part for me, your oath doesn't have an expiration date. And the fact that you need at least to speak up, that's the first duty we have, in my opinion. What do you think? Well, it's the Constitution. I mean, you know, it's, it, you know first of all, um, you know, the Constitution is based or supposed to be based on certain natural rights. So it doesn't even just, you know, people want to make the argument that it only applies to Americans. It doesn't just apply to Americans. It's a it's it's a structural document, but it's also a philosophical document. Mm -hmm. And and my biggest problem is, I mean, you know, when you're 18 or you're 21, whatever, and you raise your hand, you know, and and you take an oath to the Constitution, you really don't understand what that means. But as you go on through life and you and you study it and you think about it, you know. To say it is, it's beautiful. I mean, there it, it also has a lot of weaknesses, but it's it's beautiful, and <coughs> it's not even so much the Constitution that we're defending; it's the ideals underlying the Constitution. I agree. I agree. It's the uh, ideals. For me, it starts with the Declaration of Independence. You know, that's the the first one that document. They normally don't they don't want to talk anymore about, especially at schools. I mean, it's almost right. a subversive document, but that's the spirit of America, the, the, the first founding document. Now, uh, you ever, I'm sure you heard about General Smedley Butler. Uh, he's one of my favorite yeah. generals. Uh, you know, I would like to think, you know, people sometimes they try to name us or label us just because we don't fit in the profile of, uh, you know, if you are, I don't know, a patriot, you must be pro-war, okay? Uh, if you are a lefty, you must be anti-war. I would like to remind out there to all the people that they're still stuck in this sort of a cage. There was a general that probably many of you may not have heard. He died in 1940. Uh, he was one of the most decorated U.S. Marine Corps general. Okay, he was a ma major general. Uh, his name was Medley Butler. Uh, give us a little bit of a... Tell us... More important, tell to the people what do you think about General but Butler, about his mission to speak the truth about the real purpose of uh, of the military unfortunately after the last you know as you said you know what is exactly found out this guy because this guy wasn't a hippie okay it was a real military guy but he was the one the most critic against the misuse or abuse of the military forces under the let's say control of the bankers that's pretty much his mission what do you think about him well, well, first of all, you know, we, we talk about Smedley Butler as being a major general, which means a two-star general in the Marine Corps. Yeah. And today, and today that's a big deal, but it wasn't nearly, it's not nearly as big a deal now as it was then. Okay. Because that's as high, because that's as high as you could go in the Marine Corps at the yeah. time. And he is the only Marine Corps general officer and one of only, oh, I think it's a couple of dozen uh, people ever to get the Medal of Honor twice. Now wow. you can't do that anymore. You can't twice. do that anymore. Um, but to get it e to get it even once is amazing. Yeah. Um, and he and of course he got it for you know for his commands. He got it. You know he didn't get it because he went and he you know charged a machine gun nest. He did it because you know he went into places where people probably thought he couldn't. Um, accomplish his mission, and and he and he did it anyway. But one of the things he realized during his military service, actually, I don't even think it was during. I think it was either at the very end, yes, or it was after he retired. Was that he had been duped? That he had been an enforcer. 
for Wall Street and the big banks. Now, don't misunderstand me. I'm a capitalist. I believe in free enterprise. Mm -hmm. I believe in free trade. I believe in contracts and agreements between people with no interference, you know, in the middle, as long as you know, as, as long as it those relationships are only between the people who are making the agreements. I agree. Um, but you know, he you know he realized that he was being played, and that all of the people in the military were being played, and that and and that's the same thing that's you know going on today. He he retired a little bit after World War One. And he saw that millionaires and even billionaires, and I'm talking about billionaires in, in, in 1918 money, were being made off of government contracts during the war. So an, ama- in a, an immense amount of wealth was flowing into a few pockets. And who was paying for it? It was the soldiers. It was the ones who were getting killed. It was the ones who were getting PTSD and seeing their friends killed, even though they didn't call it PTSD back then. They really yeah. didn't understand it very well. Um, you know, and it was, a, it, was, it was their family. So it was a really very small number of people who were, who were benefiting from this, but there were a lot of people who were being abused. And, in fact, the military, by its being duped, is the one that gets abused. So... You know, I I agree absolutely. His book was called War is a Racket. Yes. You know, people can people can read it online and it's very short. It's only about 20 pages. Uh but you know, maybe you can you can link to that uh, yeah. if if that's something that you can do on your website. Yeah, I'll do that. Um, it's a good idea. I would like to put a PDF there is a, you know, I always say if you want to buy that's fine, but you can download it on for free. Please go to lovegunsfreedom.com. I will post the link on the homepage at the bottom so everybody can have a chance. And this is so important what you're saying because it's a reminder to all of us to stop completely following the orders because what they're doing now, the trick is this. They fly the flag, they put some music on, and everybody must stand up and bow their heads down. And at that point, if you have a question, you're a traitor. That's wrong. That's the way they've been manipulating us for many, many years. And I tell you, this is the time to stick up, you know, first of all, for, for really, if you want to be a patriot, always questions authority, especially questions the people that they are using our colors, our flags for their personal nefarious purposes. That's my point. Question for you. Uh, we went yeah. from the Bush uh, to the Obama administration. You know, I was probably one of the few Republicans completely calling Bush names. Uh, for me, is is, is, is is a complete evil man like he was his father and unless it was clinton but the point is people think you know bushes must be a good republican because he's a conservative but my point is for me he was part of this plan i don't see no difference between him and obama it was just a continuation what is your opinion as a, as a man who served this country that probably bush was also uh, junior was also your commander-in-chief uh what do you think about him and in the role of 9 11 and how he treated this country with a minute you know with the different pieces of legislation that he pushed like the patriot act one and two military commission act and things like that what do you think well for well first of all you know bush was my last commander-in-chief your last so okay. you know the, la- the last time i was on active duty you know bush was the commander-in-chief it was during bush's administration that i started to realize that things were going wrong. Now, I retired, um, oh, a little bit more than halfway through his administration, and I was deployed, um, you know, pretty early on in it. Mm. But, you know, but it was it was actually when I was in Afghanistan, and, you know, I, I thought that we were there to get the bad guys and go home. Mm-hmm. I really thought that's what the mission was. Yeah. And, and then I was being briefed one day, I think it was by a couple of Marine Corps majors, um, who were telling me what was going on as far as, you know, like civil aid projects and so forth, yeah. and also infrastructure that we were putting in for our own garrisons. And I was learning then, and this is early 2003, that they were planning that we would be there for at least the next decade. Wow. I'd, I showed up because <laughs> I thought that... We were going to, you know, go get Osama bin Laden because supposedly he was the big mastermind. Let's see. And then we're, we were going to go home. 
Well, guess what? When I learned that, I realized that they were telling us one thing at home. Yeah. And, and let's say, but and the reality was much different. Yeah. So, um, you know, you, you have to at that point one has to start asking what the motivations are. And when things like the Patriot Act come out, which actually, to be honest, must have come out before I went, but I didn't know very much about it. Yeah. You know, um, you know, I started to realize that something was amiss. And also that, um, you, know, the, you know, the idea that you call something a Patriot Act, yeah. and, and, then, and then you use it to limit your people's freedoms even more, and it's completely Orwellian. And that's when, yeah. you know, when I got back, when I got back, that's when I started, you know, studying more about free market economics and more of the constitution and more of the history and it's just you know it, it's it just goes on and on and you know i i love this country as much as anybody could love a homeland where they were born um you you probably love it even more because you left yours to come here exactly it's true it's true i i i i, I had to live intentionally and i left my family behind so it's a it's a big burden question is after Bush, you woke up, at least you had a chance to start to really operate uh, in a critical thinking, especially after you retired. Now we have, we transition from eight years of Bush to eight years of Obama, Mr. Nobel Prize. Uh, as I said, this, is, this, this, this show is not about parties. I just look at facts. I bash everybody who I support, everybody who deserves support. What is your opinion about eight years under the Obama administration? What did, does it really deserve? Did it really deserve the Nobel Prize? <laughs> I just have to laugh at that. It's like the Nobel, the Nobel Prize for, you know, bombs. for what? I mean, I mean, you know, the Nobel Prize for being elected president. I don't know. It completely, <laughs> it, it completely discredited the whole notion of the Nobel Prize. Uh -huh. I mean, if anybody pays any attention to it at all anymore, why bother? You know, it's, yeah. it's like somebody makes a speech and they give them a Nobel Prize. In fact, Nobel. I can't ever remember his first name, yeah. is, pro is probably rolling in his grave still now, yeah. what, eight years later? Yeah. Um, let's see, because he established the Nobel, Pri the Nobel Peace Prize, which was the first one, largely out of guilt because he had invented dynamite. Wow. And he, and he, and he invented dynamite in order to make mining safer. Yeah. But they ended up using it for warfare, and it completely transformed warfare, and there's a and there's a and sort of you know, and he felt guilty. So out of penance, he established this Nobel Peace Prize, and then of course they're just basically pissing on his grave yeah. by giving it to someone who not only didn't do anything, but then went on to continue wars and make you know, and make unconstitutional wars, and nobody in Congress held them accountable. There were a few who tried, but nobody in Congress, or should I say Congress as a whole, never held him accountable for, for Libya, for what he did in Syria, yeah. you know, for what they've been doing with Saudi Arabia in Yemen. Um, none of it um, no, it's, uh, it's, no, I, it, it was really disgusting. And the worst part is that, you know, people, including in my own family, who look back at Obama, all they want to see is his skin color, and therefore he must have been wonderful yeah. because, of his, because of his skin color. And honestly, you know, the, I mean, wasn't the whole point of the civil rights movement so that we didn't look at skin color, so exactly. we didn't judge people exactly. by, you know, by how they looked on the outside? Exactly. You know, you're right. And this is sad. You know, as I said, for me, the worst part is not what Obama did or what Congress al allow him to do is also about all the supporters that uh, they were just a few months before or a few years before, you know, exposing Bush or at least, uh, let's say, protesting Bush for his illegal wars, all his act of wars that, uh, first of all, killing civilians and all this stuff that he was doing. And now the blue, they're all silent. They look at me like nothing happens here. Everything's fine. That's for me the most disgusting part. Seriously. Uh, question. Uh, what do you think about President Trump? Um, honestly, yeah, I honestly. don't know yet. Okay. Um, you know, I, let's see. I, oh boy. You know, I mean, honestly, I mean, personally, you know, I don't like the idea of power in the executive being expanded as much as it's been. 
because that wasn't supposed to be the whole point. In fact, if you at, if you really ask me, I believe in the Articles of Confederation mm-hmm. more than I believe in the Constitution. Yes. Though we're not, we're obviously we're not going back to that. No. Um, but it's just, um, you know, I, I, so far as I can tell, Trump kind of has his heart in the in the right place. I mean, for anybody who would actually want to be president, because, you know, I, I, I really have to wonder about, you know, the let's say the the mental state of anybody who would actually want to, you know, preside over the executive branch. But it doesn't seem to me, at least that he believes that there's only one branch of government. Mm-hmm. Well, I, and I, that's cl- that's clearly lo- what Obama believed, because yeah. it's like, oh, okay, fine, you guys you know, you know, guys don't want to play ball, then yeah. I'll just do it myself. Exactly. And my point is this, you know, I completely agree with you uh, on the limited role of the presidency that as a, when it comes down to uh, make executive orders. The executive order used to be just from, you know, hey, let's get some more paperwork for the whatever the office. I mean, it was never like now legislate. The legislation part supposed to be done and supposed to be done always by Congress. But for me now, if Trump, President Trump, is using executive orders to remove previous executive orders, I mean, I don't think it's fair that Obama said before he left office, oh, I really hope uh, President Trump is going to go through Congress to remove my president uh, to my executive orders. No, <laughs> yes. I, I said that on video. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I mean, that was uh, insane. You know, so let's see. Let's see how it goes. If he can stop to his uh, executive orders to at least remove the unconstitutional executive orders that President Obama did, I- I'm okay with that. The point is, after that, we need to bring back uh, uh, the basic idea of this republic. My only concern is this. Uh, is it going to fall for the trap? Especially, you know, the president, after all, is surrounded by many elements that he cannot even much control if, unless he really wants to. Uh, when it comes down to foreign policy, I mean, he's still going to drop bombs on Syria or going to Ukraine, things that we have no business, in my opinion. What do you think? Well, actually, that's one of the part, parts that really concerns me. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I don't remember what it was I was listening to, but there was someone who was uh, discussing, it might have even um, uh, been on the Tom Woods program, who is actually just giving us a background into what was going on in the Middle East and also with Russia. And, you know, I mean, obviously I have, you know, a little bit of a background in education as far as, you know, what was what goes on in NATO and why NATO was formed and the history of NATO and, you know, blah, blah, blah. Certainly I have served, um, you know, with forces, uh, you know, within NATO. Uh, and uh, you know, and so, and but what's hap- been happening since the uh, you know the Eastern Bloc fell, since the Soviet Union unraveled, is that NATO has been expanding eastward toward Russia. Yeah, and Russia's getting kind of nervous. Yeah, and in fact, it, in fact, it was just what uh, I guess it was two months ago now, because Obama was still in office. You know. He, he started sending troops to Poland and possibly Lithuania and certainly other of the former Soviet states, which are now parts of uh, NATO. Yeah. And, and, you know, and, and can you imagine, I mean, can, can you imagine that you know, there would be a Russian president sending troops to, like, Canada? Yeah, or Mexico, yeah. It, well, exactly. No, the, or or Cuba. Yeah. You know, I, we've done does it. We've done this before. You know, let's say this tape is played before. You know, not very long after I was born. Yeah. In, in Cuba, and you know, did we get all freaked out by it? You bet we did, and yeah. we almost went to and we almost went to war over it. So what's with putting the pressure on Russia? I agree. I you know, I, you know, and 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 so and and don't misunderstand me. I'm not a Russian fan. In fact, I've, you know, I, I don't speak Russian. I've never been to Russia. You know, I, I grew up, you know, in the Cold War. Um, you know, I, 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 I believe that, you know, Putin is probably a, you know, let's say a, a thug and a, um, um, a kleptomaniac. Okay. Let's say, however... You see, what you don't want to do is unnecessarily poke a bear. No. And one thing I like about Trump, I tell you, uh, it was just a few days ago on the news 
is uh, when they were asking, you know, about, um, you know, the Russian being killers and being bad guys. And Trump said, wait a second. You think our guys, they're good? I mean, they have the only killers. I, I'm trying to paraphrase it now. You think our country is so innocent? I mean, the fact that at the end of the day, um, everybody does their interest. And for me, what they're yeah. trying to do is uh, they try to demonize this threat like like Russia because they try to demonize like Afghanistan, you know, like they try to demonize. They need always a boogeyman because the military industrial complex, that's the only way can stay in business for 50 more years. That's the point. Well, I mean, fun, fun, actually, funny how you should say that, because for those who study history, you know, go back and look at World War One. Yeah. You know, how was how was that even really different? You know, say, oh, we're going to stay out of the war. We're going to stay out of the war. Uh -huh. They say, but they say, but before long, we started saying, oh, well, you know, the Germans are the bad guys. And in fact, you know, it, it was because they demonized Germany that Hitler even was able to get a foothold. Yeah. You know, because you know, because they you know what did Germany do? Germany didn't do anything that. Um, you know, that uh, France and Britain hadn't done. They were just the last man standing on the other side, so you had to, so they had to demonize them and blame them for the whole thing. Well, you know, when, when, you, start to, when you start to do that and you make things bad enough, then, you know, wait 20 years and what happens? Yeah, I agree. You know, bad stuff happens. Lisa, I want to say, first of all, I want... President Trump telling Fox Let News me play in this. a brand new interview, he respects Russian President Vladimir Putin. I'm sorry, Putin. you're breaking up. Lisa, That's Lisa. not new. Here's what is new. The president acknowledges that Putin may be a killer, killer but adds, quote, we've got a lot of killers. Listen. Do you respect Putin? I do respect Hello. him. Do you? Why? Why? Well, I respect a Hello. lot of people, but that doesn't mean I'm going to get along with him. He's a leader of this his country. This may be part of the, the uh, issue I, I was... Say uh, it's I was, better to get along I with was, Russia uh, than not. Will I am you about... Why don't you, no why you call me right back, and uh, hopefully you I'm can... I'm here, I'm here, I'm here, Michael, I'm here. I was just playing a little bit of uh, Trump, President Trump, say about he respect Putin, you know, and uh, it's a part from the CNN. Uh, I will want mm -hmm. to play that because I think it's important. The fact that finally we have at least a man that he does not fall for the trap that, uh, you know, we need to always point out a bad guy out there, but a little more objective. And what he was trying right. to say that, you know, I mean, yes, uh, they we have killers too. I mean, not everybody's perfect. There is no good and bad. I believe always there is somebody in be, in between the black and white. There is a gray area and everything. Lisa, I want to give you the floor. You have two more minutes. Whatever topics you want to touch, whatever say message you want to say before we close. Well, all I have to, all I really want to say is that you know, first of all, you know, people need to think for themselves. They need to be critical and not believe everything they hear at face value. I'd say, but the other thing is that, um, yeah, there are certain things that um, uh, you give me uh, optimism. When it when it comes to Trump, um, however, I had I I didn't vote for Obama. I didn't like Obama. I thought Obama was a socialist. But once he got elected, I tried to be optimistic. And of course, you know that didn't turn out very well. And, but you know, so therefore, I'm also guardedly optimistic, as I was with Obama about Trump. I'm liking what I'm seeing so far. But you know, but again. You know, government is best that governs governs least. And I mean, I would you know the the, the idea that people you know that, that some third party should get between you know peace you know uh, peaceful actions uh, you know and relationships between other people. It's like someone walking down the street hand in hand with someone and have some third party come in completely unknown to them and uninvited and pushing themselves into that relationship. It's just not right. And we'll see how much this new government wants to do that, even though, you know, it's looking like it wants to do it less than the previous one. So very you know, good. We'll Lisa, I really appreciate uh, your input and the time to share uh, your opinions, because I tell you, I want to be sure that people out there understand that uh, our soldiers, our sailors, 
are human beings and they have a brain and they, of course they have their opinions unfortunately sometimes when they are in service they cannot express themselves but we need to know their feedback we do need to know I treasure your experience I really treasure the things you've seen and also your process thinking process because I think that's the most patriotic thing to do is to speak up looking and searching for truth and when it comes from people like you I think it also gets more credibility so I want to thank you for that well, th- thank you, Luca, and I, I appreciate your, your talking with me today. Most of the veterans I know, honestly, after a while, once they've gotten out of service, as long as they don't glorify those years you know, too much, which a lot do, they start to come to a lot of the conclusions that I've come to. But, but they keep you so busy when you're actually on active duty in the military that you really don't even get a chance to think about these things. In fact, you're discouraged about thinking about politics at all and yeah. you know and and that can be very dangerous i i hope they still teach the constitution within the military i because certainly they taught it to me be, you know, as i was getting ready to become an officer but i i just don't know thank you thank you michael okay guys this is uh, luca azanna you're listening to love guns and freedom on ktalks 1340 a.m we are ready for our number two it's going to be about guns we're going to have a great guest uh, and more news, more exciting news. They remember, this show is not about entertainment. This is about try to learn things that normally you cannot learn from other, you know, medias out there. It's just an, an humble local radio show, but it's becoming more and more international through the internet. And I appreciate your support. Please, if you want to support the show, don't forget there are many ways. Go to www.zannacoffee.com. Great coffee, the best organic coffee you can get. And more important, of course, if you are anywhere around the world, you can download any of my songs. www.zanna.us, more than 100 songs I wrote and published myself. Even just with 99 cents, you can keep this show free. And we can have freedom of speech ever, always. Thank you very much. Don't go away. Ready for our number two. Hey, you. Yes, I'm talking to you. You deserve a break. Enjoy a moment of indulgence. It's time for Zanna Coffee. Guilt-free pleasure. Zana Coffee is the organic coffee to amplify your senses and enhance love for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Only the best organic and GMO-free coffee beans from around the world that I selected. Zana Coffee brings you happiness in every cup. Fair trade certified sustainable organic coffee. That means we do not use slaves. Free Zanna songs with every coffee bag. Find Zanna Coffee at www.zannacoffee.com www.zannacoffee.com Get your coffee bag now. Don't be cheap. Life is too short and you deserve the best. Zanna Coffee. You're listening to Love, Guns and Freedom with Lucas Zanna on United States.fm Network.